Well, good morning, City Hill. I hope that uh, you are all doing well today and staying strong. Uh, well, we're going to be back in the book of James today. And uh, as I was preparing, my neighbor came over and said to, said to me, she's loving James. And in Portuguese, uh, James is Tiago. Uh, I wonder how many of you knew that. And French is Jacques. Well, we, that's where we're going today. We're back in the book of James. And um, one of the things James is helping us do is uh, how to live differently in this world. And uh, it's, in fact, it's easy, isn't it, to just blend uh, with this world, to look like the world. But I'm reminded of this. We are meant to be different. Uh, we are the redeemed people of God. We have been saved. We have been, God is, has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Uh, he has given us His Holy Spirit so that we can image His Son. And there is something about, so radical about God's work of grace in our lives that uh, transforms us in the way we live out our lives in these days. And the truth of the matter is, I think you know this and I, I know this, we don't always look like what we are. Sometimes what we are isn't always seen as clearly in what God says we are. And uh, this is the thing that brings James to address the, something that he has observed in the life of the people that he is uh, ministering to, these people who have been scattered because of persecution, and he's seen something amongst them that he knows he needs to address. And I'm going to read from James chapter 4. I want to read, stop by reading the four, first three verses there. And uh, the words on the screen, if you've got a Bible, you're welcome to turn there. Uh, you can underline and whatever you... But I want to read these. It's, this is the scripture, James chapter 4, from verse 1. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. I'm giving the title to today's message the inside battle. And the reason is this. I mean, we look around ourselves and look around this world. There's a global reality that is highlighted from the fallenness of this, of this world. We, we see the fallenness. We, we don't have to take long to be able to stand back and just see that around the world there are, there's something wrong. We all know that. There's wars. We hear of wars all the time. Um, it's nothing new to us. We actually even sometimes watch them live as they happen because now this is the way it is done. Whereas in the old days, wars would be fought and we'd hear of the news later. Today, we watch what's happening in real time. There's a global reality of, of, of this. And we know the, the social unrest. Some of you from Zimbabwe know what's going on there and the challenges that are there. Then there's South Africa with its own challenges. So there's a global reality to this. Then there's a domestic reality. It comes very close, much closer to home because uh, we see this. We see husbands and wives fighting. We see children fighting with their parents. And it just seems so close to home. Last night, one of my, my daughters was uh, coming home and s saw a lady in the street with a baby screaming, and they stopped to see if they could help, and only, discover, only to discover that somebody had just been shot and killed in their home. This world, something's wrong, don't you feel? It's the domestic problems. But it goes even deeper than that, doesn't it? It goes to the personal level. It's a personal reality because all of these battles start within us. I know we often think it's the other person's fault, but these 
apples, all, you know, whether it's a global war that's going on, or whether it's domestic problems that are happening, or whether it's something in our own lives, it starts in the heart. And, you know, it's our hearts and our passions that drive us. And it's so easy, so easy to get a offended, so easy to get angry, so easy to hold, be bitter towards other people. It's easy to do this, easy to want it our way, isn't it? So, so often, I just want it my way. And I think in James's experience, he feels that he needs to address something that he sees in the lives of Christians as they are getting mad with each other. And I want you to understand this. It's Christians. They, it's their it's power struggles that are going on. Maybe he, he's standing back and seeing some bitterness and anger. I just want to pause this message right now because, you know what, this might kind of sound like a, a strange subject to be going into, but it's a real subject. I want to just speak to those who may be watching and haven't yet crossed the line of faith. You haven't come to faith in Christ, and you, you're checking out this Christian thing, and You've been checking out Christians, and sometimes Christians put us off being Christians. <laughs> it's totally understandable. But I want to suggest to you one of the, the greatest um, arguments for the truth of this book, the, one of the reasons I believe we can trust this book, is that when it speaks about people, it speaks about Christians, it speaks about the heroes even of the Christian faith, it doesn't try and paint them in this picture-perfect painting, it exposes the flaws. And here is James having to address people who were on mission, who were living, who are Christians, but were really struggling along the way. And if you ever imagine that joining a church or becoming a Christian is just going to be, man, Christians are these bunch of saints who have this halo around the the head, and they wear white robes and stuff. Please, no, that's that's a terrible picture. Anyway, it's like, uh, can you imagine that? But but it's crazy how sometimes we have this idyllic view of what a Christian is, and then when you really discover real Christians, we find that they got flaws. But that's the reality, and that's what James is speaking into here. And so he's asking a question: What is the source of wars and fights among you? And he's wanting uh, this to progress beyond just a theoretical study of the problem of the heart to something that we overcome and we find victory in in our lives. And that's what he's helping with to us with today. And he starts here. He starts with these three verses. Understand your heart. Understand your heart. Your heart. We often... We become students of everybody else's lives and everybody else's hearts. Oh, they've got this problem. But sometimes we need to study our own hearts to see, is it not your passions that wage war within you? Now, he's not opening up this up to a philosophical debate, but in fact, he's asking you this question, expecting the answer, yes, that is it. That's the reason. That's the problem. And I think just even that word passions, don't you find that it's a, a strong word? It speaks about things that drive us. That, we often use that, the phrase, like, that person's so passionate. They, they're passionate about what they do. Why? Because there's something that's deep inside of them that's welling up and driving them to do what they do. They believe in this. They, they're after this. And I think this is where in our lives, you know, we're passionate people. But passion is challenged because we find that the Christian life is in many ways this we find this reality of two worlds colliding and there's this conflict that's in us on the one hand that where there's a life that we want to worship Jesus with we want to honor him we want to glorify him and we do but so often on the other side there's a heart to satisfy self I can do it my way I want to pursue my pleasure I want to do things so that I'm you know, getting what I want. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, expressed something similar in Romans chapter 7 when he wrestled through this and he said, you know, the things I want to do, I do not do, and the things I do not want to do, I do. And that's, there's this tension that's constantly going on in our lives. It's like, how do I bring this under control? 
Maybe you found this in your own life and you've come up with the, these questions that you ask yourself. I can't believe I just said that. Well, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I can't believe I did that. Or maybe it's something like, that's just not me. Now, James takes that answer. <laughs> if you take the answer that James, the question that James gives, and you put that in there, don't you find the answers the same? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? This tension that's going on? And this high, highlights something. There's something wrong. And the root needs to be addressed. And I think this is what we're after. We, we want to get to the root of it. The question that he's pushing us to ask is, what is the prominent driving a passion that is driving your response in life? What is the thing that drives you? And you've got to look at the fruit. You've got to look at the fruit. Because unchecked passions are problematic. And so sometimes the reality is we actually need other people. This is why the church is so important. You know, when people go, you know, I don't need the church. I don't need the people of God. I don't need the, the, the gathering of the saints. I don't need Christians in my life. The problem there is actually we do. That's how we, Christians may, not, may be imperfect. That's, you are, and so am I. And so if we, if we reject people, those are the instruments of, of grace that God wants to use in our lives to help us understand what's going on in our passions. Let me carry on in the scripture, because he goes down to verse 4, and he, he, he brings some startling revelations for us here. In verse 4, he says this, You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be a f the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the Scripture says, the Spirit He made to dwell in us envies intensely? I think once we get to understand our hearts, we also need to do, take another step and go, let's understand God's heart. And friends, don't forget, he's speaking to Christians here. He, he calls them adulterous people. And maybe you, it's a little bit startling. Wait, wait hey, aren't we children of God? You know, but he calls them adulterous people. And in actual fact, uh, you know, if that kind of shocks you, maybe it should right now because it's, Jarring because it's revealing something about God's heart for us. You see, because your actions show what, your, uh, what passions drive you, or your actions reveal what the passions, the things that drive you really are. And when it's away from God towards your own pleasures, we're told that's spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. And when you become a Christian, you know, Remember that time you surrendered your life to God. You said to him, Lord, I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm living for you. And at, at that moment, there was something that happened. You repented of the whole old way of life, and you said, Lord, I want you. I'm living for you. Along the way, something happens, doesn't it? And when you choose to let a passion for your pleasure drive you, that rather than the passion for God's pleasures, for God's glory, God says that's spiritual adultery. Ad adultery happens when you've given yourself to someone, but then choose to shift that affection that you promised to that person onto something or someone else. And that's hostility towards God. And maybe if in your life, I mean, I think I was thinking of a few different ways this can be seen. There's can be seen through the compartmentalized life. You know that life where you're going, I'm going to keep my spiritual and my secular life distinct from one another. They don't, they don't speak to each other. So I come to church, I worship God, I go back and I do whatever I want. You know what the Bible is saying? 
That's spiritual adultery. Sometimes you think God doesn't care, but He cares deeply about that. Or maybe others of you, it's just the re rebellious life where you go, you know the way God wants, but I don't care and I'm going to do my own thing. That's hostility towards God. There's also the indifferent life. Think about that one. Because sometimes that's the one that we don't think is as offensive. But that's the neutral life. That's the life that just goes, well, I'm not going to live in any direction. But God has called us to live for His glory. That's what He made us for. And so there's three things I want you to understand right now that are so important in our, in our response to God, in relationship with God. And that's this. Number one is God wants what's best for you. Do you believe that? God always wants what's best for you. The reason why God has given the law is because He knows what's best for you. He designed you. He created you. And what's best is always His way. The second thing is this. God gave His best for you. Think about that. Jesus. You couldn't even claim to be a Christian apart from Jesus. God gave His best for you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. God gave His best for you. And God gives His best. Because God gives of Himself to you in His Son. And then He gives of Himself to you in His Holy Spirit. So one of the reasons you're living with this tension in your life, and it's, it's a good thing. If there's no, no tension there, worry. Because when the Spirit of God is in our lives and is alive in us and working in us, there's always going to be that tension. We're always going to be struggling. What do I, what's the right thing? What's the God-honoring thing to do? God gave His best for you. And God, thirdly, is jealous for you. This isn't a, a scorned lover kind of jealousy. This isn't the kind that is, you know, just there's something sinful and horrible about it. This is beautiful. Because he is jealous over your life. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for your faithfulness, for your wholehearted allegiance to him and his will. And that's an indication of a love that you can't find matched in anything else in this world but his. He loves you so much that when you go the way of your pleasure, he knows what's best, that he longs for better for you because, and he's jealous for that. Do you know why? You are his. He bought you with his own precious blood. You're a trophy of his grace. He looks at you and he smiles. He wants to delight in you. He wants you to delight in him because that is the best thing for you. A delight ought to be in Him, in pleasing Him, bringing glory to Him. So we find ourselves in this place where this tension is, but how do we respond? And this is what we come to now in verses 6 to 10. And look at this. But He gives greater grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud. Oh man, I'm so glad it doesn't stop there but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, <laughs> we get grace. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. 
respond. How do we respond? Respond with a pure heart. And I want you to, I want to just look at that briefly. Here we find God is a God of grace. I'm so glad about that. Can you imagine if he was just this God who judged me about what I did and what I didn't do? And, you know, it's the end of my life. I got there and I had to weigh up my good and the bad. And, and it's like, oh, yeah. it's the way people sometimes see God. It's just ridiculous because our, our bad always outweighs our good. And our good can never cover our bad. But God is a God of grace took his son, and he took our sin, and he put our sin on his son, who took our punishment and gave us life. Grace. What did you do to deserve that? Nothing. All you brought to the equation was your sin, and God gave grace. So we find not only do, do we begin the Christian life with grace, we continue the Christian life with grace, and so he, he gives grace to the humble, and that gives you an indication how, do we, how does this responding look like? What does it look like? Well, humility. It takes humility to admit that the root of my problem is my pride. It's not what other people have done to me. It's not what, you know, uh, I, I feel it's, it's here. It's my pride. It's my ego. It's at this point that we've got to take responsibility for our hearts and our passion, because when we do and we get to re realign that towards God, we get onto the road towards victory. That's the starting point. Then he says, Submit, submit yourselves to God. What, what do you want? What do you want? Oh, let's submit that to God. Let's bring what I want under His gracious care. And love and concern for me. He's going to give me tons of wisdom when I do that. Because we're going to start to learn to change direction and go where God wants us to go. Submit to him. Resist the devil. I don't think there's anything passive about that. You know, the Christian life is incredibly active. It's like, I've got to submit to God I've got to resist the devil. When the devil starts to come along and go, you need this. No, you've got to go, I don't need that. I need what God wants because what God wants is always best. And what the devil wants is always for my downfall. He doesn't care about you. Resist him and he will flee. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He will draw near to you. Grace. Come in faith. Friends, I want to encourage you. Let's, let's have lifestyles of drawing near to God, of going to Him and go, you know, acts of submission, pushing into Him and going, Lord, what is it that you want? How do I, how do I hear from you? What do I do, uh, you know, uh, w before you? Come in praise. Come in worship. Come in prayer. Hold, hold on to the truth of God's word. He's the one who invites us to himself. He says, come, come to me. I'll give you rest. Come. Pursue holiness then. He says, you know, cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded. Do this. Come in. Come into him. You know, this isn't COVID sanitizing stuff. It's like, you don't. Cleanse your hands. Okay, I've done the sanitization before God, and now I'm, I'm, I'm ready. No, God is saying those hands that serve, let them serve what is pure, what is God-honoring. Do it. Come to me. Pursue holiness. God is, you know, this is taking responsibility, responsibility for your actions that are keeping you from God. This is repenting and embracing His cleansing. then feel the horror of your sin. Look at that in verse 9. I mean, be miserable and mourn. That's not language that we use. We go, hey, like, be happy. We're Christians. 
But if sin is involved, no, grieve and mourn. Okay? Be sorry, not for the consequences of your sin, but for the fact that you have offended God. I always think it's such a challenge, you know. So many times I've found people caught in sin, they, they, they don't have this sense of, of God in it and how it's offended God. They just, when they get caught, they feel, oh man, I, I sinned. And it's more the remorse for their sin because now they've been caught than actually the fact that they've sinned and so there's repentance. Bring repentance into the equation. That's right. That's why I, I, I still believe repentance is something for the Christian life. We bring it into life. And then he says, live humbly. So the way you, you start embracing this path to victory you continue to live in that way. Live humbly. Because when you do, He will exalt you. You don't have to exalt you. You don't have to pursue your exaltation. You're not living for the praise of man. You're not living for the, the applause of man. You're living for the, the smile of your God. And His well done. James MacDonald has written this. He says, at the end of the day, because this is a lord, lordship issue I'm talking about, yeah? the ultimate test of lordship is not the crisis of deciding that you believe this, but the process of allowing your will to submit to His at the point of pressure, the place where He and you might disagree on what to choose. He becomes Lord in your life as you choose His choices above your own. It takes me to the last two verses for today. Verse 11 and 12. It says, Don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And he's bringing this back around to the beginning. Because he, what he's wanting you to do is celebrate a changed heart. See, how do you know, or how do I show that I've made progress in defeating the stronghold of sin in my heart and to seeing that these passions are brought under control and under the, uh, brought into submission to God and lived out from that place, passionate lives for His glory. I think it's shown in two areas. One is in a right view of yourself. You understand who you are. You understand that you're not the judge. You're not the one who's going to pass judgment. God is. What a liberating thing to realize. I don't have to judge. I'm not that person. The second thing is this, a changed attitude towards your spiritual family. Don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters, he says. It's the church. We may be imperfect. But guys, remember this, we're family. And don't forget this, this family is going to going to outlast my physical family. This is the family that I take into eternity, so I need to get some stuff right with them now. And it's no good bringing my pride and my arrogance and too much of myself into the equation so that it's my stuff that I'm pursuing when actually it's God's glory that we are pursuing. And when we all get that, man, stuff changes. As I finish, I just want, want you to know, James isn't trying to show us that the church is this perfect group put together beautifully. No, it's far messier than that. Uh, I've been in church long enough to know that. I mean, I probably was in church from the first Sunday that I was born 
that's what my parents were like. They were like, oh, you're around, we go to church. And it was like that through my life. I mean, barely missed a service, church a service on a Sunday. But that's, that's my life. But I know, and I've seen, and I've experienced how messed up sometimes Christians are. But you know what amazes me? These are the people that God is at work in. He's saved, and he's teaching us what it means to look like Jesus and carry the mind of Christ. We're not perfectly there yet. We're still on this journey. You're on this journey. And in this brokenness, God is using his church to change this world. I'm always struck by Ephesians 3.10, where it says, So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may be known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. It's like this church is making declarations in heaven about how wonderful the grace of God is. Think about that. How radical it is when the church lives out who we are, and we show who we are through our actions. Jesus loves his church. Many times I've been tempted to go, I want to give up on this thing. And then Jesus reminds me, but Bruce, you're part of it. Any problems that you see out there, man, you carry some of this into that because you are still in the process of being sanctified. Friends, we know that battle inside is real. But let's pursue victory rather than settle for complacency. Let's go for God and His glory. Let's get back to the place where we are humbly submitting to God and resisting the devil and drawing near to God and cleansing our hands and purifying our hearts and where at times we will be miserable, not because I just feel all bleak today, but because I've offended God through my rebellious heart and God is drawing me back to Himself. But I know that when I humble myself, he will exalt me. I don't know where you are in your walk with Jesus today. But I know that God, if you've crossed that line of faith, if you've come to faith in Christ and you're following Jesus and you are, your heart and you're living with that tension, I want to worship God, but I'm living that tension of the self, selfish, prideful life. I want to tell you something. When God gets it to work with you, it's not always easy. It's sometimes painful. But that's because he wants you. And he's jealous for you because he loves you. Can I pray for you right now? I want to pray that God will just stir something in you in response to this message that will result in your heart being open to him soft towards what he is wanting to do, and that you would be a person who has known your passions for him and his glory. Father, I thank you for opportunities like this where we can worship together. So grateful for, even in these times, we have technology that we can use for your purposes. But thank you that we get to worship you. Thank you that if we are experiencing that, these tensions, that we do experience these tensions because it reminds us that you are at work in us and it reminds us that you always want what's best for us. Thank you for giving the best for us. I pray that as we live out our lives, we would live them for your glory and that you would do radical things through City Hill Church in the days ahead as ordinary people, we would see you, an extraordinary God, working powerfully for your glory.